the Business Advisory Implementation Development Service. The Bates program is a major step forward. A game changer for the Black business community. Designed specifically for Black entrepreneurs, by Black entrepreneurs. Bates provides expert help to Black businesses. It addresses the most important barriers to Black success. Entrepreneurs need four things to be successful. Access to capital, to network, mentors and sponsors, access to processes. Une façon de travailler avec les entrepreneurs pour vraiment les amener à optimiser et maximiser leur projet entrepreneurial. We're going to sit with you and we're going to wrap you around the best experts we have. Cash Pro will help black business owners get access to more payroll resources. Anybody that needs to get more funds to amplify their business. ACBN, we do grant writing sessions. The support, it's tremendous. I have a lot to learn and I feel as though I'm, I'm in good hands. I'm really looking forward to all that we're going to be able to accomplish together. Please check out bbpa.org forward slash bathe. Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the first session of BAIDS. We are so excited to have you all here. Great to see you all as well. You're welcome to turn your camera on as you if you would like. Um, but just to let you know, this is recorded. So we're going to get started because um, Teo is here who has amazing information that he's ready to share with you all. But before we go to Teo, we are going to have words from Mr. Michael Pinot. Thank you very much, Victoria. And um, on behalf of the BBP, I, I just like to say welcome to this our first um, workshop that we have on beads. Uh, on the third of first, the, the government of Canada announced the opening, the long-awaited opening of the uh, the, the Black Entrepreneur Fund that will make. Uh, 293 million available to the black community in loan funds. And as we speak, the BBP is being bombarded with a lot of questions. Even though it's not our fund, we're not managing that fund, but we are working seriously in the black space. And so uh, forums like this is designed for you guys to ask all the questions you may have and all the things you may want to know about everything that you may want to know. Um, we'll have uh, uh, what we call knowledge experts and content uh, experts here each week to tell you what they do, how they'll be a part of the BEEPS program, how they'll interact and how they'll improve what you're doing. So again, thanks for coming here. And I always like to end by saying, I know there are other places you could be and you choose to be here. So we really appreciate that um, from the board of the BBP. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to go into and tell you a little more about our guest speaker for today, Teo Simmons. So Teo Simmons is a managing lawyer at Simmons Law, a civil litigation law firm with offices in Ottawa and Toronto. In this role, Teo regularly represents business owners on a wide variety of matters, including incorporation, corporate organization, commercial leases, shareholder disputes, regulatory matters, general in-house counsel, and contractual disputes. His commitment to helping others extends beyond the courtroom. Teo is the president of the Gwen Simmons Foundation, a registered charity committed to alleviating poverty and empowering women by providing bursaries to single mothers enrolled in post-secondary studies. He is also the founder and CEO of Demos Legal Inc., a tech startup specializing in legal document, document automation. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Teo Simmons. Thank you, Victoria. I appreciate it. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, before I get into my presentation, I'll share my screen. Uh, I did want to thank Nadine, Michael, Mac. I know that there are a lot more people uh, that are responsible for the Bates program and putting this together. Um, but those are the people that I've come across. Uh, and I just really want to thank them for putting this together. When I started my firm five years ago, I wish that there was a program like this. And so I'm really happy to be a part of it. Um, also, I think I saw Ryan 
Ryan Knight here uh, as one of the participants. So Ryan r runs the Afro-Caribbean Business Network and I actually heard about the program uh, through a newsletter uh, from the Afro-Caribbean Business Network. So hi, Ryan, uh, thank you for uh, putting me onto this. And so I'm just gonna share my screen here and jump into my presentation. Okay, so Victoria, are we seeing my notes yes, or what we're supposed it. to see? Okay, <laughs> let me swap. Is that better? Better. Perfect. Okay, so uh, the title of the presentation today is Closing Arguments, Understanding Your, Your Legal Obligations. And so before we jump into it, um, I think everybody's muted. I don't hear any background noise, but uh, please mute if you do have a question. Uh, feel free and there will be opportunities throughout. I want to keep this interactive. I want to keep this fun. Uh, legal matters don't have to be boring and, and this certainly won't be a boring presentation. So let's stay interactive. And so feel free to unmute um, and then mute again. And so there will be opportunities at the end of each section and at the very end of the presentation to ask questions. Also, um, feel free to ask questions in the chat now, when I'm going through, I may not be able to catch it. So Victoria will, will help identify any questions in the chat. And so while we are talking about the chat, I just want to get an idea if, if everybody can just write your business area right now in the chat. I just want to get an idea of um, which areas are we talking about? Because I want to make sure that my examples are relevant to the work that you're doing, right? And so I don't want to give examples if nobody here is doing uh, retail or if people are doing retail, maybe I'll give more of those examples. So just take some time just to quickly tap in just a word or two. Um, what your business area is, I'm just going to take a quick look here. Okay, so marketing, consulting, software development, biotech, marketing, health and wellness. All right. So we've got a a pretty wide spectrum here. That's good. Okay. Oops, let's stay here. Um, and then the last thing before moving forward. So this is a start of a conversation. Uh, you know, obviously we can't cover everything in an hour and we don't even want to try to cover everything. But what is going to happen at the end of this hour is everybody here is going to have a very good understanding of what their legal, legal obligations are as a business, but also I'm going to bring to your attention some common areas, some common issues, some missteps so that you don't make. Teo, you got muted. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, what I was saying is at the end of this presentation, um, the goal is that you'll know about business organizations, you'll know about registrations, you'll know about some common uh, issues. And so just a little bit about myself. Um, first, uh, I, I'm a regular contributor. I like to read, uh, to read, but also to contribute and write uh, legal articles. So this is an article I wrote for the uh, Canadian Association of Black Lawyers uh, magazine on shareholders agreements, why it's important, why every single incorporate, or excuse me, every single corporation with multiple shareholders needs a shareholders agreement. Uh, and so that's a bit of, of what I do, uh, I guess is fun. And the other part um, Victoria mentioned is I do run a tech startup as well called uh, Domus Legal. And so one of our apps is Get Justice. And so Get Justice is an app that allows people to file for divorce online. And so you can file for divorce, you can reply to a divorce online and in uh, going through that interview, you can have a consultation with a lawyer. And so uh, you know, obviously divorces are expensive, family law is expensive. I get justice is uh, a tech startup that I'm working on to, to fix that. We also do small claims as well. And so I, I say that all to say that I have the, the legal background, but I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I started my own law firm five years ago. Uh, and I just started another tech uh, tech startup. So uh, this is a real interest of mine. Okay, so here's where we're gonna go. Uh, really wanna cover four different areas. 
and this should take us about 40 minutes to get to the end. First is the setup. Uh, getting set up, we're going to talk about business organizations. We're going to talk about setting up your bank account. We're going to talk about HST registration. I, I do understand that a lot of the businesses here today have already been set up, um, but so, some are still pre-revenue. So we'll go through that. And also, a lot of that information is still relevant if, you, if you've already set up because, well, if you're operating as a sole proprietorship, which I will define, you can, you can always incorporate afterwards. And so we'll cover that. Then getting started, leases, contracts, cash flow, uh, really, really big issues. And then growing your team, uh, whether it's other business owners or contractors, employees, and then I'll go, go into some discussion and uh, we can have some back and forth about the decision between hiring a contractor or hiring an employee. And then of course, we never wanna get there, but sometimes we have no other choice and that's that's going to court. And so I'll, I'll go through that. And so, there, there won't be a test. Uh, there's no need to remember anything uh, here. You know, it's the remembering part is my job, but I just want to make sure that everybody's aware. And so, like I said, before we jump to a next section, um, I'm going to pause and we can take some questions verbally or we can take them through the chat because sometimes if you wait till the end, you, you forget your question. I don't want anybody to forget their questions. So, when I started practicing, um, I was given a book called Good Luck, and I'll, and I'll talk about that book later. And Good Luck described two different people who knew each other growing up. They were elementary school friends. They fell apart, you know, life happened, and they're in their 60s, and they meet up again. And, and one guy just, he was in the twilight of his life. He was enjoying retirement. Everything was great. And the other guy was down on his luck, and he was kind of just talking about all the issues. That, that, that he had encountered. And, and the book, it's, it's not technical, it's a quick read, um, but the book was, was saying, well, you know, one guy created conditions for good luck and good fortune, and the other guy did. And 60 years later, you see uh, the results of that. And I think that, that for me, that really helped me starting my business. Um, and I think it will help you as well if you're getting started or if you're going through and I'll talk about that book a little bit later on. All right, so business organizations. Um, I do a lot of these presentations um, for, start, for startups, for entrepreneurs, for owner-operated businesses. And this is one of the most common questions I get. And so we'll, we'll take some time at the end of this slide um, to spend a little bit of time to take some questions here because I, I want everybody to be clear. And so, First, I'm gonna go through which uh, the, the characteristics of each of these business organizations and then talk about some of the interplay. So first, a sole proprietorship. A sole proprietorship is just another way of, of saying this is a business that, that you own personally. This is, uh, this is not a separate extension of you, this is your business. What does that mean? That means that, uh, you're filing personal taxes for this business. There is no separate entity. Um, you have a, likely a personal uh, bank account. Uh, if you're sued, you're sued personally because it's you have a business name. And so to give an example, um, I think I saw some, maybe some consulting companies. There's a lot here. So let's just say I have a consulting company. It's called Teo Simmons Consulting. Um, that's a business name that I might register, but but I can just operate that as a sole proprietor. And so I imagine probably a lot of you in here are sole proprietors. Often when you're starting out, um, that's what you see. It's usually either sole proprietorship or a corporation. And so personal liability to recap, personal taxes, um, and you only need to register your business name. So like I said, if my business is called Taylor Simmons Consulting, I'll register that name with the province of Ontario, um, and that's it. I have a legal business in Ontario. That's all I need to do. And so that's why it's so common, because it's the easiest to get set up. It's the easiest to, to move forward and to go with. Next, partnerships. I won't spend a lot of time here because I don't see a lot of partnerships. But partnerships are simply two or more people with a common commercial pursuit with a view to profit. And so it, it, you can almost think of it as a, a sole proprietorship 
just with multiple people. So we don't have a separate corporate entity. We have a, a partnership entity. And so at law, that's a, a unique, uh, uh, it's a unique relationship. But once again, we don't see many partnerships, uh, but I did want to cover it. And the other one, this is a big one, is corporations. Um, corporations, I, I always, always, always recommend uh, to my, my clients to incorporate. Um, why? So for a corporation, that is a separate entity from you. And so I said, Teo Simmons Consulting, that would be just me. Let's say I've been operating for six months, a year. Revenue is good. I'm getting more clients, but I'm concerned about the liability. I'm concerned about, well, what happens if I get sued? I own a house. I own a vehicle. I don't want somebody to, I don't want to be exposed for my property if I'm sued. Um, a corporation limits that personal liability. We call it the corporate veil. And so a few of the advantages of incorporation are limited personal uh, liability, very limited. It's difficult to, to pierce the corporate veil, as they say. Potential tax benefits. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to get into the tax part. I'll leave it to the accountant, and I'm sure we'll have an accountant uh, one of these Thursdays. So I'll leave that, but there are potential tax benefits depending on how much revenue uh, you're bringing in. Easier to raise capital. And so you can issue shares. Corporations issue shares. And so it's, it's much easier to raise money if you're a corporation as opposed to if you're a sole proprietor. Um, survivability. And so, yeah, I think every business owner at some level, we're starting the business because we want something that, that we could potentially pass on um, to our children or our family or, or, or what have you. Uh, corporation is the best way to do that because a corporation, a corporation survives the individual that creates it. It survives the shareholders. It is a separate entity. Uh, whereas a sole proprietorship, if you pass away, that's your business. Your business has passed away with you. With the corporation, it continues on after you've passed. Um, real quickly, uh, just to, to go on to the, uh, well, actually, I won't get into that. Maybe I'll just open up for some questions right now on business organizations, on corporations, anything I didn't cover that somebody maybe had a question about. So, Teo, I'll join you for a moment and read through some questions that we have in the chat. So, question from Ryan. Is there ever a scenario that you would encourage a person to be a sole proprietor rather than a corporation? Yeah, yeah, there's a number. There's a number of situations where you would. Um, they're often from an accounting or from a tax perspective. But for me, if I'm just looking legally, um, it's very rare. So from a tax perspective, when I talk to an accountant, accountant says, well, Corporate, corporate tax returns are expensive. There's this, this, and that. Sure, we can say, let's, let's do a sole proprietorship. But just legally speaking, uh, it's very rare. I have a hard time because you have that limited personal liability. Uh, and, and for me, I just think that's really important. So legally speaking, I, I'm, I'm always going to say incorporate, uh, but that's not always the right answer that's the accountant who would come in and say, well, maybe we shouldn't, but legally I, I love incorporating. Okay, question from Chris. Could there be any way to incorporate without a co-founder yet? Um, so we'll start with there and then he has a, a add on question to that. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. So you can incorporate, uh, you just need one director. And so you need one shareholder, uh, or just one person, let me just start there. You just need one person to incorporate. Um, I get this question a lot where somebody says, well, I have somebody who may come on as a director, who may be an advisor, they may be a director, or maybe they'll be a shareholder in the future. We can add that later on, and that's relatively quick. And so you absolutely can do it on your own. And and often it's, it's better to do it rather than I've some clients who are waiting for somebody and you know how people can get, oh, I'll get back to you or you're waiting and you're waiting. And so um, you can get started just by yourself. And then the next, it says not incorporating limits opportunity 
but would you advise incorporating at all costs, even if one is still searching for a co-founder? No, it's it's not at all costs. No, it's not at all costs. And and I think it's important to note if you're operating as a sole proprietor, you, we can incorporate you. It doesn't have to happen at the outset. And so if you've been operating for a year or two or three, well, after year three, we can do it. We can do it after year four. There's no deadline uh, for incorporation. And uh, Ava and Tasha want to know about um, nonprofits. So question from Ava, where do nonprofits fit in? And then Tasha had a question. If you incorporate as a nonprofit, can you later change it to a for-profit? So I'll, I'm, I'm going to speak briefly about not-for-profits. So I'll hold that question. Um, as far as changing, you would, you would want to dissolve that not-for-profit corporation. And so depending, that's a bit more of a, a tricky question that we would probably take offline, uh, but you'd probably want to dissolve it. And then we'd have to look into um, what are the assets and whether we're doing it properly. Okay, I can just take two more and then I'll have to move on. Okay, so question from Craig about the shareholders agreement. Um, what is the cost and process for creating a shareholders agreement for investors in a company? and then a legal binding representation of ownership of a corporation. Where Craig's yeah, so, uh, okay, and I'll take, so for, I'll take the second question first. Your legal binding representation is your certificate of incorporation and your share certificate. And, and that's done at the outset, so that's easy. The first part, shareholders agreement, um, I'll, I can just talk about timing, so, if I get all the information I need from all of the shareholders, I mean, the challenge with the shareholders agreement isn't on my end because I can plug in these provisions. It's when there's a disagreement between shareholders saying, well, maybe we want this, maybe we want that. But the timing, three weeks to a month, if everybody is diligent and, and uh, they're not changing answers. Just one more question before I move on. Okay, one more. <laughs> And then we'll go from there one and we'll loop back around. So let's see, nonprofits. Um, what are the costs to convert to sole, proprietor sole proprietorship to corporation? And then we'll get the questions after that. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the filing fee for federal incorporations is 200. Uh, the business name registration is about 600. Um, and then there's legal fees on top of that. Uh, so in the range of a thousand dollars, give or take. Um, I understand that the Bates program is, is taking care of some of those fees. So, you know, I, I don't know if we want to talk too much about the fees, but that will give you an idea of it. Uh, I see that there's a lot of questions, which I'm happy about. Uh, but like I said at the outset, this is the start of a conversation. So I'm glad to keep this going. We'll have, we will have some time at the end, but please feel free to reach out to me and I'll give you my information. Uh, but we just, we, I love the questions, but we won't be able to get to everything. Okay. Uh, before, before you move on, um, Simmons, just want to interject something quickly here. Because in the chat, there was a question about starting a nonprofit and then making it profit. Um, I know you're going to get to that at the back end, but I just want to tell the folks that's not something you want to do. Because when you, when you dissolve a nonprofit, none of the equity that is sitting in there can inure to any of the directors or anyone. It has to be given to a designated charity or given to the government as taxes. So you don't want to start a nonprofit. It's very um, productive and so on. And then you believe you can then make that nonprofit into a profit. It, it, it won't work like that. Yeah. OK. So uh, not for profits and charities, um, um, as Right there, as, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfect segue. Who so, who am I comments if I know you're going right there? <laughs> <laughs> no, you threw it up, you threw it up there. Uh, so as Victoria said at the outset, um, so I, I know a lot about charities, I run a charity. Um, I, I created the Gwen Simmons Foundation after my mother passed away, so it's a a charity that gives bursaries to single mothers uh, who are in post secondary education. And so I, I operate a charity, but I also 
uh, incorporate not-for-profit corporations. I register charities for clients. So it's something I'm very comfortable with and enjoy doing. Um, and I'll just speak briefly on this process of registration. Not-for-profit corporations, it's, a, it's really a very straightforward process on my end. Um, there's, there's not much to it and there's not a lot of delay typically, once again, if I get all the information I need from, uh, from the director, it's a straightforward process. Charity registration, now there's like this boogeyman with charity registration. I talk to people, they say, oh, doesn't it take a year to, to register a charity? It's so hard to register a charity. It, it takes some time, but I, I feel like the, the fear about charity registration exceeds the actual process. Uh, once again, if you're diligent uh, and back and forth with CRA, I mean, they do often have follow-up questions and, you know, there's, there is a big due diligence process, but, uh, but certainly don't be afraid of registering as a charity and keep in mind the tax receipt advantage is, is, is huge. And so don't be dissuaded from charitable registration because it takes a little bit of time. Um, it, it, it really, it, it really, in my experience does not take a year now, I don't know. In some cases, it takes a year, but it ought not to. Um, in my in my experience, before COVID, before COVID, uh, we're looking about three three months, uh, give or take. Business licenses. So, uh, I mean, there's a number, a number, a number of businesses uh, that I saw in the chat, and in Toronto in particular. Toronto is notorious for having just a lot of different business licenses. So obviously we know if you have a food service business, you're going to require a license. Uh, but even if you're a commercial dog walker, and so if you're walking between four and six dogs in the city of Toronto for a commercial purpose, you require a business license. <laughs> and so, <laughs> sorry. Um, and so it's just, just to be aware there's there's a lot going on but once again this is something that that we do so we take care of it but uh, but certain businesses not all but certain businesses will need to register for a license to operate legally and so once again food service secondhand stores pet stores obviously taxis uh in toronto if you're if you're a commercial dog walker um but this typically also it, it's not typically a, a long process. And so it's something you have to check off. It's something that we'll do at our firm, but it's not, once again, it's not something to be fearful of. It's just something we need to take care of. Um, I'm gonna roll through a few more slides and then we'll pause again for questions. So real quickly, after you register your business or after you incorporate, you're gonna set up your bank account um, what documents do you need? If you're incorporated, you'll bring your certificate of incorporation. Think about that as basically it's a your birth certificate for your corporation. That's the first document. That's the document that 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 says that evidences that your corporation is a real being. And so you'll bring your certificate of incorporation. If you're not incorporated, you know you'll bring your business name registration uh, to your banker. You you don't need sales or revenue to set up a bank account. And in fact, it's it's often the first step so that you can get sales and revenue. Uh, I've spoken to business owners who, who didn't do this first and it caused, causes big headaches moving forward. So I would just say, do it as soon as possible and, uh, and, and take some time to build a relationship with your banker um, because over time that can be a really valuable relationship where your banker will occasionally call you and tell you about um, not just new banking products, but, but really some beneficial things to help your business out. Another question I get a lot is HST registration. Uh, so first question is, do I have to charge for HST? Uh, it depends. There's a, a rule called the small supplier exception. And so if you make, uh, less than $30,000 in four calendar quarters. And so essentially a calendar year. Um, so if you make less than 30,000, you're considered a small supplier, you're exempted from charging uh, 
HST and remitting HST to the CRA. After you've exceeded the $30,000 in the four calendar quarters, you need to charge HST. So just keep in mind that that small supplier exception. Uh, but once again, this is something that we do at our firm. We register HST accounts with the CRA. Um, also an important point, that 30,000, that doesn't, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a corporation or a sole proprietor. Um, if you exceed it, you're gonna need to charge and remit HST. Another thing, and this is, you know, I'll be that self-deprecating. When I started out, when I started my firm, I, I didn't know anything about HST remittances. Um, and, and I filed quarterly. And so you have an opportunity to find filing quarterly or annually. Uh, and I filed quarterly, which, mean, which meant that I had to get my bookkeeper every three months to run these numbers. And every three months I had to remit these numbers to the CRA. And after a year, I said, this is expensive. I'm paying my bookkeeper to do this all the time. There's gotta be a better way. And she said, yeah, most people do it annually. <laughs> and I said, why didn't you tell me that off the bat? And so I wanna pass that on to you so that you know if you're getting started, um, most businesses do it annually. It makes the most sense financially quite often. So you're not paying your bookkeeper every three months to do it. It's just, it's often much more simple. Um, questions before we jump into the next session. Section, excuse me. I can take about two or three. Oops. So if we want to just kind of continue down the line of where we where we left off, um, you can let me know if we can get back to it. But what's the process of setting up a holding company after you incorporate? Uh, that's that's an offline conversation. We can do it. Um, it it's we can, it can be done. I mean, what I always say to business owners when I get questions like that on corporate organizations is almost anything can be done. It's just, how do we want to structure it? So that's an offline conversation, which would depend on your particular circumstances. Okay. And I'm going to hop to some of the hands that were raised. So Sankufa, you were, had your hand raised earlier. Yeah. I just have a quick question. I was uh, I was curious around the conversation around corporate veil, and I know insurance are very expensive as well. Now, is there a way when somebody oversteps a certain level of legality that the corporate veil is actually pierced and people can go after the individual, even though the corporation has the veil? Is there that moment? Yeah, there's a number of instances. Uh, so if there's gross misconduct, if there are uh, employee, I believe employee wages that are uh, outstanding, a director can be held liable. So there are instances where that veil will be pierced. Um, but generally speaking, uh, if you operate a corporation, you are separated from personal liability. I'm sorry, we, we got to keep pushing on, but we will have some more time for questions. I just want to make sure I get through all of this. All right. And so this is a, another great saying. I mean, really for me, the way I think of this is, you know, we start our business, we operate our business um, and something changes. And so, I mean, if the plan doesn't work, you change your plan, you don't change the goal, you know? And so I, I talked to, entrepreneurs time to time were really discouraged by certain things that take place and say, well, just operate, we'll move. This is a part of it. Let's pivot. And so leases are the single biggest issue uh, that I see for, for entrepreneurs. Um, we'll see how that looks moving forward uh, with COVID you know, we'll see how many commercial leases and, and what that looks like. But to date, leases are the, the number one biggest issue. Um, I apologize for the dad joke, but, but please talk to a lawyer before signing your lease. Please, please, please. And I'll explain why. Um, residential leases are tenant friendly. There's, there's a number of uh, provisions and legislation that protect residential tenants. That's not the case really for, for commercial leases. Commercial leases are, are more so just creatures of contract, as in, look at the black and white, look at the contract, you're bound by the contract. Um, 
and leases, uh, commercial leases can be really dense. I mean, it's not uncommon to see a 30, 60 page commercial lease with some schedules. It could be 80 pages. It's a lot, even for a lawyer to go through. Um, and, and more often than not, I see uh, business owners that sign the lease without, without giving it to a lawyer. And so even clauses that may not appear to be controversial can be. And so our mind usually goes to the term, what's the term of the lease, what's the rent? You know, that's usually kind of what we hone in on, but there's other clauses like hours of operation, signage, um, where we see, I see a lot of disputes happen. And in fact, in the past three years, I've dealt with five or six black owned businesses that uh, essentially failed because of lease disputes, not truly because they were, the business was failing, but because of the lease dispute uh, aggravated situations and, and they just stopped operating because of it. So one company was a catering company. They received verbal assurances from their landlord uh, about rent. And so this uh, catering company, the landlord said, we're going to do renovations. I understand that this is going to affect your business. You can pay us less rent because it, it, it's going to, it's going to impact your business. And so my client did that and they did that for several months. And then the landlord turns around and says, those arrears are due. You, you, you owe that rent. And, and my client naturally said, well, you gave me these verbal, nothing in writing, these verbal assurances. Um, we all see the unfairness there, but legally it's, it's very, very, very hard to go to a judge and say, here's this lease. And in black and white, it says, this is when the rent is due. Uh, this is the amount of rent. And so that's what the landlord is going to say. And then my client's going to say, well, we have this verbal assurance. I have nothing in writing, but my landlord did say that, well, I could pay less. In almost you know, nine times out of 10, it's the, the landlord that's going to win that argument. Why? Because most, most leases have a clause that's called an entire agreement clause. And all that means is that at the end, it will say, everything in writing, all the schedules, all the paper, this forms our entire agreement, which means there's nothing else that can happen. Uh, there's nothing else that's represented non, uh, not in writing that's gonna be a part of our agreement. And so it's, it's particularly saying these verbal assurances, they don't hold any weight, don't rely on them. Um, and a lot of business owners just aren't aware that I don't want to sound too critical, but a lot of landlords are being very shrewd, very ruthless, and taking advantage of, I think, business owners who are acting in good faith and expect the landlord to be acting in good faith, and that often doesn't happen. And so I don't say that to discourage you from getting into leases. I just say, give it to a lawyer, let a lawyer review the lease, um, to at the very least, maybe we won't be making a lot of amendments, maybe that's not possible, but to at least key you in on the potential issues. I had uh, just real quickly, and then we're, we're cutting into time, we're gonna have to move a bit quicker, but uh, I had a church that at least a, a building in a strip mall and they worshiped. And then the landlord turned around and said, well, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to use the microphone. You're not allowed to have musical instruments. Uh, and they said, well, we're a church. You knew we were a church. And so that's a lease dispute we're going through right now. But once again, had I received the lease at the outset, I would say this is going to be an issue. Contracts. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm a, I'm a big music fan and I've been watching Versus for the past year. And I was, I was strolling through social media and I saw this tweet from Bow Wow. And I loved it. Like a tear just went down my face. I was like, this is the best thing for me to see. You know, it's like, I need the contract first. I'm not just going to perform. And, you know, why would Bow Wow say that? And so for anybody uninitiated with Versus, it's basically, it was on Instagram. I think it's on Triller now. Two hip hop artists uh, playing one song and another song it's called the Versus a battle, but it's really just a celebration. So they're just, they're playing their the biggest hits and it's a lot of big stars. And so, you know, in Bow Wow's case, 
you know, why is he going to say I need to see the contract first? Well, how much is he going to be paid? When is it due? Is he still going to be paid if the other artist doesn't show up? Uh, There's one versus with Brandy and Monica where Monica got COVID. And so they had to cancel it. And so Brandy's ready. If Brandy uh, cancels other engagements because she's ready on that date and Monica gets COVID, well, does Brandy still get paid? We need to, we need to know that in the contract. Um, what happens if the app goes down? So starting out with versus, they had a lot of technical te- technical issues. What happens if it goes down? Do I still get paid? I'm here. I'm ready to go. It's not my fault. Do I have a right to share in the profits? Uh, can I use the footage? Can I use the versus footage for commercial purposes? Can I advertise by showing the the versus footage? And so, you know, contracts. It's that's just an example, but it's not just for big recording artists. Uh, it's for everybody. And so, this is another big issue. I see leases, but the other problem is that a lot of business owners aren't creating just a standard contract for their customers or for their clients. And it doesn't have to be long. One or two pages uh, can do the trick in most instances, Um, especially if you're a consulting company, you want to have something. And once again, one or two pages can do it. Also, it helps establish trust uh, and signals professionalism. Okay. And so it's just, when you start out by sending a contract, you're giving a signal to the side that you're serious, that you're very professional. Um, Website terms of service. And so we're seeing more and more web-based businesses. You need a terms of service. It's non-negotiable. And you can't just take one off of Google. You want it. I mean, terms of service, let me just back up here. This is your opportunity. You can call the shots, right? And so if you have a a web-based business, you draft the terms of service, you can call the shots. And so there's no reason for you to be in a, in a bad contractual situation because they're your terms of service. And so pay attention to it, have a lawyer sit down with you, have a call with you to determine what things should be in your terms of service. I'm just gonna check our time real quick. And then upfront payments, um, wherever possible, where, I, I can't say this enough, wherever possible, get as much money as you can upfront um, and put that in the contract. Why? Why do you want to do that? Cash flow. So most businesses have a what's called a net 30 provision, which means you send an invoice and a client is required to pay that invoice in 30 days. Now, most of your expenses, when you think about it, aren't net 30. Your lease isn't. Your lease is due at the first of the month. You're not going to tell your landlord to wait 30 days. Right? So your lease is due when it's due. Your online subscriptions, they come out of your credit card right away. There's no 30 days to that. Uh, Your insurance, that's due when it's due. Your credit card fees, they come out. Taxes are due immediately. There's a number of expenses that we don't think about, uh, but a lot of these expenses are due immediately and they're taken out of our accounts automatically. There is no net 30. And so what happens is you have a profitable business where they're making money, but it's coming in too slowly or they're having to chase it because often they don't have it in the contract. They don't have uh, up, any provision for upfront payments. And so you really, as much as possible and every business is different. And so I'm not gonna say a general rule, you know, I'm not gonna say take 50%. That's not the right approach. The right approach is think about your business and take as much as you can upfront because you don't want to chase money and you want to have that in your account. You want to know you don't want to to have to chase it. You don't want that variable there. Get the right people on your bus. Um, You know, when you're starting a business, I don't know about anybody else, but I felt like Will Smith where I had everything ready to go. And it's like, okay, it's just me. Like I've got to create something now. Um, and then you get going, you get moving, you get sales. Uh, and then it's it's like the, the saying, good to great in that book, good to great. I don't know if anybody's read it. You got to get the right people on your bus and you need to put them in the right seats. And so that relates to business owners. You know, we had the question earlier about adding directors. 
is this the, is this a, the right person for the job? Do you work well with this person? Um, are they in, are they in the right role? Uh, and then also contractors and employees. That's an important important decision. So, real quick, uh, most small businesses are going to start out by hiring independent contractors because there's more scalability, there's more flexibility, um, and it's it's easier to do. And so, I mean, really, all you need is a contract with an in independent contractor, and you can create that relationship. Employees are a bit more costly in the sense that you have obligations, you have payroll taxes, you have to issue T4s, uh, vacation entitlements, notice periods. All of these things come, on, come along with employees. And so often you'll start with contractors and often the work will dictate you moving towards part-time, a part-time employee, a full-time employee. Um, most common issue is, is once again, it's just not having the contract. And so, I mean, I, I, I don't wanna to be too somber here to, to do more gloom because really the, the message is simple. And I think it's an upbeat message, which is um, just talk to a lawyer and just, just have a contract in place. But most of the time, the issue is not having the contract. Um, there are some poor contracts that I see from time to time, but most of the time, the issue is there is no contract. And then going to court, um, alternative dispute resolution, this is the, the number one, the best option. Whenever somebody calls me and says, oh, you know, I had this dispute with somebody and I told that person, I'm gonna call my lawyer, I'll see you in court. I just think like, that's, that that has like, just no power. It's like saying like, uh, you know, the Leafs are going to win the cup this year. It's like, it just doesn't have, and I'm a Leafs fan, so I can say that, but it doesn't have the same power, you know, and it's because you're not going to get to court quickly and court has a lot of costs and we'll get into that. So it, alternative dispute resolution. I want to key everybody in on this because this is relatively new. We've seen fake Google reviews before, but in the past few months, I've seen this pick up quite a bit where, we think disgruntled customers or competitors are either directly creating anonymous accounts and making fake Google reviews, or there are reports of, of companies where, that are actually being contracted to make fake Google reviews. And so what happens is that you get a fake Google review, you see it, you know it's fake, it's negative. Google has a process where you, you complain. Well, more often than not, nothing happens. And so you're stuck with this negative review. It's not true. And if you're a web-based business, if Google is very important to you, you know, I don't need to tell you how, how important that is to remove it or have it addressed. And so best practice, first, see if Google will review it, go through that process. And that's something I can assist with. And I've, I've done that before for other clients. Next, if we can identify the person, we'll send something to them directly, but often they're doing it anonymously. That's, that's the whole game. They're hiding behind, hiding behind that. So you reply and you reply professionally, you reply persuasively, but you're not really replying to them. You're replying to the other people that are going to see it, right? And so say you have a food service business and someone, you know, they say, oh, I, I had the, the chicken marsala and it was da, 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 and you don't even offer chicken marsala, right? And so you could address that in your reply, but also don't just be on the defensive, use that as an opportunity to say, you know, our restaurant employs industry leading food preparation equipment. We train all staff on food handling. I mean, use it as an opportunity to tell your business, take that negative and make it positive because people are gonna look at one star. I mean, you're gonna look at a one star review. So let them see the good. And then when you contrast these terrible, poorly written fake reviews, and a well-written reply, you know, it's a no-brainer. The other part is demand letters. Uh, somebody owes you money. Um, demand letters are the best first start. I'll say often they aren't successful. Um, and unfortunately, the only ones that I ever see that really are successful come from a lawyer. Um, but because court is so expensive, you definitely do wanna start with a demand letter. I'm gonna keep pushing through because I, I know we're, we're a bit past time. I've got few more 
uh, slides before we get into questions. So litigation, costly, lengthy, and it's uncertain. Cost just cost doesn't just mean money. Uh, most of my work deals with disputes. And I, I think we as people have a hard time conceptualizing things that are emotional costs or stress. And so we just think, oh, how much money? How much does it cost? Well, what about the time where you're having trouble sleeping? You're not eating well. You're snapping at people around you. It's weighing you down because litigation is adversarial. People are saying bad things about you. They're impugning your character. They're lying often. It's not pleasant. Um, and so it's costly, not just financially, but it costs your well-being to go through that. Lengthy as well. So, you know, I'll just use the small claims example. In Ontario, the limit for small claims is $35,000. Before COVID, if, if, if a claim was diligently brought, and I mean, you know, the lawyer was on it, they were, they were doing everything that they needed to do promptly, you're still looking at 12 to 18 months until you get to trial. Okay. And so that was before COVID. So it takes long and it's uncertain. There are no slam dunks. Enforcement. And I wasn't being lazy. There's a reason why the bullets are the same uh, because it's true. <laughs> People also think, you know, we have clients and, oh, we want a trial. Great. Excellent. We still have to get the money. Just because you get the judgment doesn't mean you get the money. And so there's enforcement processes where you can look to garnish their income. You can seize their property, personal property, real property. That's great. But that costs money because, well, where do they work? We need to look into that. What personal property do they have? That takes a lot of time. Um, and so I say that all to say, you really do want to avoid litigation wherever possible. Sometimes you can, when you can't, you know, that, that's when we'll step in. Just finishing up real quick, reading list. Uh, these are two books, the two most influential books for me, uh, starting a business I mentioned, good luck at the outset. I, I'm not a big reader. Like I don't like reading for fun. And so these are perfect books if you're like me. Uh, good luck is like, 70 pages i mean you can get through it in a day and it's it's and there's there's nothing technical there's no jargon it's a fable about two people but it really helped me understand how i should approach business so definitely check out good luck and the e-myth um, is another great book um i listen to it as an audiobook because it is longer and so i'll just say quickly just to give you a teaser i'm not getting any uh any royalties from either of these but Basically, the entrepreneurial myth is that people who start business businesses are entrepreneurs, one, and the fatal assumption uh, that an individual who understands the technical work of a business can success, successfully run a business that does that technical work. And so real quick, what does that mean? I have a client who's a barber. He worked as a barber, then he opened his own barber shop. And so he's been operating for a few years. He's the only one there that cuts the hair. He does all the marketing. He does all the advertising. He does everything. And he doesn't just start it out. He's not in survival mode. He's been going for a bit, but he's not relinquishing any control. And so all he's done is he's created another job for himself. You don't want to create another job for yourself. You want to create a business. And so I have another company or a client. It's a hair salon. My client's a hairstylist. He barely cuts or styles anybody's hair. He runs his business. He teaches his contractors how to do it his way. And then he builds other, uh, you know, hires more people, builds more, um, uh, more venues. And so, you know, that's the difference. We want to, as quickly as possible, multiply, teach people how to do it our way rather than to always do it on our own. Real quick, finishing up. So this is Simmons Law team. Uh, we're glad to help and assist. Uh, and provide any legal advice or any general business advice as well. So I went a bit long. I didn't get to as many questions as I wanted to, uh, but I think we got through a lot. Mr. Pinock, I see you unmuted yourself. What would you like to share? I, I, I would just like to share today is seven to seven folks that are here, that this is the quality folks that we have that will work with you guys. 
as you go through the BEEBS program to you know, enhance and, to, and to, to scale up your business. Uh, Mr. Simmons is one of our service providers that when you apply for legal assistance through the BEEBS program, will be taking on your case. And as I sit here, I'm just telling you, you know, I've been around for a while, but I've learned so many new things as I sit here just now. You know, you talk about the business and I've said it as an accountant from time to time. Uh, there's a there's difference between creating another job for yourself or creating a business, you know, and, and that is such a fundamental thing to understand. I've said to folks in the past, the owners of the business work themselves to a frazzle. They can't even speak with their accountants. So rather than they running the business, the business is running them. So thanks again, Mr. Simmons, to come on board. And, and again, to those right here, this is a sort of uh, resources that we have available to work with you as we go through the pro, um, your business cases going forward. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And just, just to finish up, like I said at the outset, this is the start of a conversation. There's a lot of questions we couldn't get to, but that's good. That means we can continue this conversation. Um, now, I don't know exactly what the next steps would be if somebody wants to keep it going. Michael, do you know what the next step is if somebody has some questions or want me to? There, 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 are there, are two approaches, there are two approaches, or a number of approaches we can make. First of all, you have got your information in the chat so they can reach us to you directly. Um, they can also reach out uh, to, to, the, to us at the BBP. Um, that's another way. And for those who have applied for resources through the BBP, and one of those requests has to do with legal uh, assistance, you know, doing contracts, leases, they will be speaking to someone like you, um, Toya, on, on, on the system. So those are three areas there that uh, the next step would be. Remember, this forum here is to have folks like you who are also service providers to speak to the folks who's going to need some of these services so they get a, a, a chance to assess you, you know, live and direct and are now hoping to work with you um, once we assign their cases to you. Excellent. I'm going to put my, my contact info back up. Apologies for taking it down. I'll swap. Oops. How about we do it this way? That makes more sense. No. If you put it in the chat too, we'll, and, and where the BBP will get back, you know, we we'll have the information for you. Um, individual like Mr. Mack would be on top of it and we can get it out. So individuals that need to get to you can get to you directly or get to you through the BBP. Perfect. And as I said earlier, you're one of the folks who will be providing services. So if someone asks in their request for legal assistance, they will more likely be speaking to someone like you or directly with you in the future through the program. Yeah, looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I dropped in um, Teo's email into the chat and then he also has it sharing on the screen with us. So we just want to thank everyone for taking your time and joining us today. Thank you, Teo, for the amazing presentation. I know you can't go through the chat with so many questions, but they're saying excellent presentation. They enjoyed it. So just thank you so much for your time. And so just remember, we will be back again next Thursday, again at 12 p.m. Eastern. So please, please come back and join us next time and see who we have for you. Excellent. So thank you so much and have a wonderful remainder of your day. Thank you. Take care, y'all. Excellent, excellent, Mr. Simmons. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I can see where this program will certainly enact what we have to do because of the most of the Thank you.